our uh, next last presentation, uh, which is by a kind of collective subject now, um, uh, because it's um, three people from the Greenhouse Studios project. So I will briefly introduce them in alphabetic order. Uh, it's um, Garrett McComas, uh, has, who has been part of the Greenhouse Studios as a project manager and researcher for over a uh, little over a year. Uh, he got involved with the Digital Humanities projects, uh, obtaining his Masters of Library and Information Science. And he is interested in the ways that technology and design can expand traditional modes of scholarship to include new forms of expression. Tom Lee then is part of Greenhouse Studios as a design technologist. He has worked on a range of innovative interactive digital projects, uh, AR, VR experiences, tabletop games, video games and web apps, etc. Drawing on experience in music, engineering and design to create and apply creative approaches to the domain of scholarly communications. Tom contributes design and development of the interactive experience plus which is the team's primary media output. Um, finally, Sarah Sykes joined the Yukon Library in 2016 as the Associate Director of Greenhouse Studios. Her educational background includes research in art history and American studies, as well as digital humanities and library science. She held positions in museums, academic publishing, public history institutions and research libraries. For the Flusser Vision Project, Sarah served as the facilitator for the launch of the project and later joined the team as a co-manager and content advisor. Great, thank you for that. And thank you for joining our presentation today on Flusser Vision, Imagining Flusser's Tomorrow. As Katarina mentioned, we're here today from Greenhouse Studios at the University of Connecticut. And our presentation discusses our work visualizing 22 fictitious scenarios of the future created by the existential philosopher, Willem Flusser. Anka Finger's talk yesterday provided a bit of background on Flusser and his work. And we wanna take this opportunity to look at our multimodal interpretation of a few of his narrative scenarios. Next slide. But first I wanna provide some background on Greenhouse Studios and the core values which drive our work. Greenhouse Studios is a transdisciplinary collective aimed at exploring the opportunities of scholarship in the digital age. We're interested in exploring methods of long form scholarly work in both digital and analog formats, including websites, online exhibitions, documentary films, virtual reality environments, really whatever format best represents the research of a given project. Part of what makes our approach unique is that we foster the kind of democratic collaboration that brings together a diverse team to work towards a common goal at the very earliest phases of a research endeavor. All the participants have an equal stake in both the creation and the ultimate output of a project and will receive equal credit for their work on the team. With this approach, we break down the traditional academic hierarchies that may exist on a project between those who are the content experts and those who are the builders or the technicians of the team. We bring all collaborators into the build side of the project, including faculty, librarians, designers, developers, and editors, rather than waiting and bringing in partners later in the process. These are also prompt-driven projects that begin with a question or a problematic and a set of resources, rather than an already fully formed research direction. This allows for the phases of iterative development, meaning that the ultimate format of the project is not fully decided at the outset, but rather it is developed through stages of iterative development and revised by the team. This work is all guided by a five-stage design process model. The process begins with the assembling of a team around a prompt and then moves through the process of understanding the prompt and defining the human talents, and then identifying the ultimate aims of the project. The build phase is the longest and most intensive of the design process and involves the iterative work cycles and prototyping of the project as it is refined. The final stages are focused on the peer review as appropriate for the format, and finally, the ultimate release 
or launch in either a digital or analog form, along with the assessment and preservation of the project. As I mentioned, the starting point for each of these projects is the assembling of a diverse team around a prompt. And the team for Flusser was convened around a body of writings by the, by the philosopher Flusser, and the participants' talents stem from a number of different backgrounds and interests. It was really the skills that everyone brought to the table that ultimately determined the final form of the project. We had originally contemplated an augmented reality experience, but the skill set of the team was stronger in game development, two and 3D design, and video content creation. And it was through building upon those strengths that we arrived at the final project format. And I'll now pass the presentation along to my colleague, Tom Lee, who will talk a bit more about Flusser's work that was the inspiration for the project and how our team began exploring some initial concepts for its development. Thank you, Sarah. Um, our project takes as its subject one of Flusser's writings, uh, Angenommen, which can be translated as what if. What if is a set of 22 scenarios that each present a possible future, many of which are predicated on the extra extrapolation of topics and themes of contemporary concern, including sustainability, political polarization, materialism, religion, othering, nuclear war, overpopulation, environmental devastation, and many more. Many of these scenarios are presented through the perspective of an inhabitant of that particular world and can be perceived as potentially unreliable narrators. The conditions of these worlds are frequently post-apocalyptic and often framed as being a form of either utopia or dystopia. These scenarios all feature Flusser's trademark metaphorical tapestry and word games. All these aspects combine to form a fertile substrate for interpretation and questioning. In fact, Flusser's intent was for these writings to be used as the basis for image making using technology that he himself anticipated not being able to imagine. Flusser explicitly dares us to transcode his written scenarios as video images and to turn the text into a film or set of videos. So what if may be considered Flusser's only film script and is related as well to his body of work referred to as philosophical fiction. While each scenario is self-contained, there is a dialogue of related themes that is active between multiple scenarios. Our team imagined that this quality would lend what if to a nonlinear form of interpretation. Actually, this nonlinear narrative aspect was something that survived multiple incarnations that our team considered along the way. Uh, the density of each scenario meant that our team could not feasibly attempt to take on the interpretation of every scenario within our roughly two year project development timeline. Luckily, we imagined that the nonlinearity of our format would also make it possible to consider a modular approach to the construction and leave the door open for other groups to potentially pick up the torch and develop the project further. Now we'd like to give you an inside look at some of our conceptual development process. In our understand phase, we use design thinking inspired ideation activities that encourage divergent thinking. One such activity focuses on encouraging collaborators to take a visual approach to ideation. Here we see a few drawings from our team members responding to an initial reading of what if. First on the left are Anka Fingers drawings which feature the Ouroboros uh, and a mention of the Bibliophagus convictus, which is an insect that consumes written texts, and also a representation of a branching nonlinear narrative structure. In the middle is a drawing of, done by Jonathan Ampia, which depicts a patchwork pathway that continually disassembles and reassembles, a visual concept which became the basis for one of the scenes in our 3D environment. The last image is by Natalie Granados, a collaborator from the Yukon Library. It depicts a scenario called Grandmother. This scenario references creation myths and reproductive biology, describing a planet where the entire solar system has been cast into a kind of primordial geography, and each part of the solar system is represented by a mountain. In our identify phase, we seek to close in on the most promising seed idea. In this case, 
In the case of this project, our team landed on an interactive experience based around physical tokens. We liked the idea of the project that had both a physical and digital manifestation. And so we were drawn to the idea of designing tokens or cards that could be used to call up imagery via augmented reality. The idea was that the scanning using the AR app would produce imagery unique to that token and that scanning sub subsequent tokens would produce different combinations of interactions. This idea also happened to incorporate experiences that we at Greenhouse Studios had recently acquired developing physical card games and augmented reality applications for other projects. Unfortunately, the pandemic came right as we were transitioning to the build phase of this project, which of course totally changed our outlook and approach to the project. And to talk more about that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Garrett McComas. All right, yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, as Tom said, uh, COVID-19 and our current virtual work environment uh, drastically have affected the, this project and really the way that we facilitate all of our projects in general. Um, so the prototyping activities we had planned to begin the next phase of the project, which is the build phase, uh, we're all kind of built around physical, physical objects in space. Um, and so we were soon faced with questions of how to facilitate the project and we're really forced to take a step back and think about uh, what formats or types of projects could accommodate a completely virtual setting. Um, so in some ways we're almost starting the project completely over, um, but like Tom said, there are a lot of through lines that kind of um, started or went through the entire project. Um, but uh, for those of us in the US, um, we're still working remotely. And so um, we've really tried to continue to refine the ways that we operate in a virtual environment, not, with, not just with this project, but with our projects in general. So one of the first activities we tried in this, in this new, new environment was to just simply have each member of the group create a vis visualization of a scenario. Um, so each member took their own approach to this and um, we ended up seeing a ton of aesthetic and, and thematic similarities between members. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, a lot of the visual style started to emerge from these early visualizations. So there, a lot of people were drawn to these bold colors like green, orange, and yellow. And you also saw a lot of these uh, sort of like clean lines, but also um, a little bit of like messiness in between that. So really these, these uh, first visualizations um, served as, really served as uh, visual cues that we took a lot throughout the project. Um, one of the dichotomies that we talked about a lot when we we're exploring this project as well was that between choice and predestination. Um, and so we saw in these early, early visualizations, we saw a lot of members try to represent this, this sort of idea and represent the idea of choice um, and how we might um, create a sense of choice in the user. And so really conceptually, we think about the scenarios as sort of possible futures that the user might encounter based on choices that they made. Um, and so you can see here different ways that our group visualized possibilities and really whether a choice in, in sort of this context is a reality or not. So for example, a person can choose doors that are laid out before them or move a chess piece on a board or um, move the character along a grid as you see in these different um, visualizations here, but they're already kind of limited by the predetermined space and the sort of environment that they're in. As we're kind of in this space uh, confronted with the pandemic and um, in the United States, a fairly grim political reality that we're still sort of living through, um, some of uh, the themes in Fuster's work became more prevalent. Um, so we decided ultimately to, to focus our project on the theme, on scenes from political life, which is a grouping, or one of the three groupings that um, Fuster had for his scenarios. Uh, but this one contains scenarios on war, peace, and democracy, among others. But those are the three that we really started to focus on was war, peace, and democracy. Um, so we also began to think a lot about sort of the place of technology and the experience itself, uh, given that um, a, a large portion of our sort of current and foreseeable future is mediated largely through technology and, and the screens that we're all sort of living through. And so we, we thought a lot about how we could create a narrative in a 3D environment, sort of using these ide ideas of technology and using screens. And so like Tom said, uh, we, we thought about this in sort of a nonlinear narrative structure, and we ultimately landed on this idea of creating 3D environments that would hold uh, TV screens that would sort of give background to the environment that they're in. And you'll see this in the demo that we'll show in a minute here. But um, we tried to basically use the TV screens to give little snippets of what the world um, was like before whatever happened to it. And so we're hoping that this gives the user a sense of exploration and also 
uh, hopefully it probes uh, curiosity into into more of Flusser's work, but also helps helps to construct an idea of the narrative of the place that they're experiencing. And so you can see a sort of like small version of what the first prototype of what this might look like here. And um, you can see the grid patterns that have kind of been a through line throughout our project as well, as, um, as, as well as the, the smaller TV screens that um, will ultimately hold the, the video content that, we're, that we use on the project. Um, and so even this like very small representation was kind of the launching off point and the prototype that we used for the, the rest of the project. Um, so to end this presentation, we're going to show you a short demo that we are a pre-taped demo that we, we have put together with uh, some narration about the, some of the design choices that we made in the 3D content. Um, if you'd like to experience the, the full demo, you can download it um, by going to this link here. So greenhousestudios.itch.io slash vision. And with that, you can also see the video content. This will mostly, this demo is mostly going to be talking about the, the 3D content that we put together. This is the central hub of the experience, which leads to different 3D environments that represent different scenarios. Conceptually, we wanted to make the experience feel like the user was going from the abstract to the concrete, and tried to reflect that in the hub. This section is slightly out of focus and surreal, trying to evoke feelings of placelessness. The user has a choice to go through different portals and experience war, perpetual peace, or parliamentary democracy. This representation began with a concept of the grid. In exploring Flusser's work, we were often drawn to the way he uses grids to explore the human need to control and understand. Each of our 3D environments embody a possible future that Flusser envisioned, and so we decided here to use dark colors like black and blue to emphasize a feeling of searching for tangible realities in a void. In line with that abstract stream of consciousness, the space is designed to be large enough to allow for exploration, but small enough to stay interesting. Each of Flusser's scenarios introduces new concepts, so there needed to be enough space to show some details of each scenario. With the aesthetic and scale of the overall level established, it was time to create specific areas of interest. Each hub has TV screens that act as portals to video content. Having them each emit a little light gave the hub some extra life. For example, in an area that represents mutations, a tree envelops the area. The final task for the hub was to make the screens bleed out content from the videos they held. The world looks bizarre with different elements from the scenario scattered across the world, balancing absurd yet imaginable futures. The abstract concepts were a blast to work with and created some challenging but interesting level design considerations. This representation is of perpetual peace. We designed the space as a long strip which prompts user to experience the shuttle of time from beginning to end. The environment is separated into three zones representing past, present, and future. The zone of the past is war, which often precedes peace throughout human history. Many peace movements were, at one time, military operations. A slogan says, if you want peace, prepare for war, a phrase used throughout history to justify violence as a means to an end. The zone of the present is the society we are now in. The towering buildings and the constantly floating balls represent the peaceful state of human beings facing reality. At the same time, it is connected to the next zone, the future. The most representative part of this zone is information processing. The prevailing mood of this space is equanimity and abstraction which promote the state of perpetual peace. This area has a rippled ground that players can step on to show that things will disappear and reappear, but never fully diminish. Scenario 19 presents a world rebuilt after the political system of parliamentary democracy, which has caused extreme polarization, ends in nuclear war. 
The optimization of political discourse through technology is implemented through the computational processing of political will. In our scene, the computer network and circuitry that would carry out this processing is built into the urban environment itself. The narrator of this scenario explains that the history of this version of Earth is reconstructed by items in the Ulan Bator archive. Therefore, we thought it was fitting to construct an urban environment set in a mountain valley. The choice of Ulan Bator as an important place in this post-apocalyptic world is meant to underscore the extent to which the nuclear conflict had ravaged the rest of the plane, leaving only the most remote cities intact. We can observe some vestiges of the parliamentary democracy system in the form of decaying political propaganda that had previously kept two halves of the population firmly at odds and managed to infect every aspect of daily life.